Hey everyone, we're about to go pick up a dog who is currently in need of a home. I've already communicated with the current owner. This dog is going to come and stay with us and live with us. We're going to train the dog and hopefully place this dog in a good home. We don't know too much about him. We've never met him before, but here's what we do know. His name is Arrow. He is a Malinois mix. The owners let me know she has done some basic obedience training with him. However, she's not able to walk him outside due to his excessive pulling. He's reactive towards other dogs. He is reactive towards wildlife. And the reason for rehoming is he does have a bite history. And I'll let you guys know some details later on in the video about that. Um, but yeah, we've never met the dog, so we're going to take you guys along the journey with us and we're going to be showcasing our process here on YouTube. So if you guys want to follow along, stay tuned. All right. So this is us and our first meeting with Arrow. We met up with the previous owners. We handed off the dogs. I got to ask some questions and my first impression of the dog when he came out of the car was damn this is a big dog right and in the beginning like I, I knew she said he was a malinois mix so i was like okay you know maybe 70 80 pounds on the big end no he's like 110 pounds so he's a big dog he's a beautiful dog i mean look at him he's just a beautiful dog and yeah he was super social when he came out like he came right up to me he's excited to see me right and he has no problem with me holding the leash which is great so this tells me about just the sociability levels of the dog the nerves of the dog uh, he's scanning the environment uh, he had no problem putting his paws up in the car here and getting into the crate. He got in with no issues, even though it's a little bit small for him. He managed uh, during the short cry ride home uh, and he did great. He was a little whiny, but that's to be expected. And so once we got home, we started the integration process and I'll walk you guys through what we did for the first 48 hours. That way you can do this with your new dog at home or your new shelter dog to come. So let's get into it. So here's what we do the first 48 hours with a rescue dog. This is just what we do. You can do whatever you'd like, but this is just, I'm gonna run you through our game plan here. We're gonna talk about the goals that we have in the first 48, and then what we do to achieve those goals. And I'll run you through examples and I'll show you the process with Arrow. That way you can learn and then apply it to your rescue dog or your rescue dog to come if you plan on getting one soon. All right, so the first thing we'll talk about is the goals. I think it's really important to be deliberate and intentional about the goals you set in these first 48 hours because the first 48 hours is a little different than like your goals for the first three months or six months or your long-term goals with the dog, right? First 48, it's a little different. So I'm going to keep this super simple, just four, all right? Just four goals to keep in mind. So the number one goal, most important beyond everything else, number one is we want the dog to feel safe. We want the dog to feel safe in this new environment that they were just thrusted into. And we want the dog to feel safe around you, this strange human that they do not know. All right, those two things. Feel safe in the environment, safe around you. And just in a second, we'll talk about how to achieve that, right? But right now we're sticking on the goals. Okay, so feel safe. The next goal that we wanna do is, and these are in, this is really the most important one. The rest are in no particular order here. But the next goal that we have is we want to get to know the dog, right? We want to get to know the dog. A lot of times when we are rescuing dogs or getting a dog from a shelter, or getting a dog from, a, from another owner, whatever it is, right? A lot of times you have limited information about the dog, right? If, if you're fortunate, maybe you were able to talk to the previous owner or the foster or whatever. But a lot of times, I know a lot of you guys too, are adopting dogs sight unseen. Like you're literally just going off a photo and like a little text description. And then this is your first time like meeting the dog and seeing the dog and then now the dog is in your house, right? So in these first 48 hours, it's important to like, let's start to get to know the dog. Let's see who this dog is, right? And I'll, I'll, t I'll teach you how to do that and stuff in just a moment. But that's what we want to do as well in those first 48. Let's see who this dog is. So the next thing is we want to start building the relationship. The relationship is honestly like the most important thing in all of dog training and whatever. But we want to start building that relationship and getting it started on the right footing, right? So build a relationship. That's the next part. And then the last part here is we just want to prevent bad habits, all right? Super simple, all right? We just want to prevent bad habits from forming. 
a lot of times people will get like a dog, come home, let loose in the house, and then boom, now they have like three months later, six months later, they've got a million problems that they're trying to fix now because they just weren't able to prevent these bad habits from forming in the first place. And so it's like the saying goes, like what is the saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, something like that. Like that's totally true. And that's exactly the case with dog training as well. So we just want to prevent all of those bad habits from forming. We don't want him to learn that you don't want your dog to learn, okay, they can chew up your shoes and they can poop in the corner, they can dig holes in the backyard and they can jump on the counter. Like you don't want your dog to learn all that stuff because you don't want to spend time undoing that stuff later on. It's so much easier just to prevent it in the, from the jump and then, like, as you give them freedom, they've never learned that those things were an option in the first place. It's so much easier that way. How do we do it? Well, the first goal is we want the dog to feel safe. So how do we do that? Well, I can tell you what we don't do. We don't come home, unclip the leash, allow the dog to run around the whole house, check everything out, jump up on the couch, jump up on the bed, right? We don't allow that. We're not just giving the dog hot dogs, hoping they trust us, right? We're not doing that either. How do we make a dog feel safe in the environment? Whether you have, it doesn't matter what type of dog you have, right? In my opinion, the easiest and most effective way to do this is three things really. Crate training, a routine, and consistency. Right? If you do those three things, the dog is going to feel pretty damn safe. Like the reason for the crate is because a lot of people misunderstand the crate, right? They think the crate is somewhere that you lock the dog in because you, you don't want to deal with them and you just leave them in there so you don't have to deal with it, right? It's not the case, right? If you crate train the dog properly, they'll find a lot of security in their crate. Like it becomes their safe place to just mentally relax, mentally feel at ease. They don't have to worry about like an, an easy diagram for you guys, it's like when you first get your dog, like it's like this, like they're living under a state of chaos and unpredictability and uncertainty. It is chaos, right? Chaos. And what we do in the training or what your goal is, as the dog is living with you, you want to create order order that's what you're trying to do that's it and if you can do this you're gonna have a pretty damn good dog in a few months all right so that's what we're trying to create right off the hop now you don't create like maximum amounts of order like all at once you've got to start like one step at a time so the very first thing is we want to create order in the house and then we'll start creating order outside and then we'll start making control on the dog and so on, right? But in the beginning, we just want to make order in the house, just get a nice routine going. So the crate, super effective. Whether you have like the most energetic, bouncing off the walls, hyperactive border collie that's just running around everywhere, or you have the most shut down, fearful, anxious dog, scared of his own shadow, the crate is going to help every dog with that. It'll give them a safe place to be, safe place to relax, a place to feel comfortable, feel, a place to feel protected, right? It's a place that they can call, it's, like, it's a little home, all right, just for them. So that's the crate. And if you don't know how to crate train your dog, you can just look up a video how to crate train. You'll find there's hundreds of videos on how to crate train your dog. Just watch like three to five and you'll get a pretty good idea of how to do it. So do that right on day one, right when you get the dog home. Routine. This is important too, because now we can get the dog on a consistent routine. We take them out at the same times, we wake up at the same times, we put them back in at the same times, we are outside at the same times, we are feeding at the same times, like it's consistent, right? Consistency not only in the routine, but also consistency in you, right? I want you to be consistent with how you are interacting with the dog, right? That is very, it's very reassuring to the dog when the handler is consistent. Like if you're all like, if you are all over the place, like as a handler, the dog isn't going to be quite sure how to deal with that. It's hard, to, it's hard to predict you. Like it's hard to read you. Like what are you going to do next? But if you can be very consistent, very consistent with how you communicate, 
your energy, your demeanor, how you interact with the dog, the dog is really going to appreciate that. And they're going to really learn to trust you, right? It doesn't have anything to do with bribing the dog hot dogs and giving them whatever, right? And I'm not saying you don't do that. I'm not saying you don't give your dog food. Don't get the wrong idea. But I'm just saying that's not how you make the dog feel safe around you, right? Especially if you've got like a super timid dog or something. A lot of people make that mistake of trying to force the dog into trusting you. You don't force the dog into trusting you. Right? The dog has to learn to trust you on their own. So the best you can do is be someone who is trustworthy. Right? And if you are someone who is trustworthy and you behave in ways that the dog can trust, then the dog will learn to trust you. Right? But you cannot force the dog to trust you through any actions that you take. Right? So let's go ahead and show you how we did this process with Arrow and you can see it firsthand. So here we're doing some crate training with Arrow. The previous owners let me know that he is already crate trained, which is fantastic, but he doesn't know this particular crate, right? So we just wanna re revisit some of the crate training practices and we just wanna build a nice positive association with being in the crate, right? So he's out of the crate, there's no rewards. He goes in the crate, there are rewards, right? The door is open, we're not just closing it, locking him in there. And we just build a nice, strong, positive association with being in the crate, right? I think this is important to do whenever you're introducing the dog especially to a new crate even if they're already crate trained it's just it's just a nice thing to do beforehand right and this crate is a little bit small for him it's kind of snug fit for him again i thought he was going to be more malinois size but he is a big boy and so we immediately ordered a bigger crate for him that way he can have a little bit more room in there um the other thing we're doing too is when we're going through the crate training process i prefer using just positive reinforcement for this whenever possible but if your dog is super opposed to being in the crate you can use negative reinforcement to train this as well i just prefer using positive reinforcement whenever possible right and so that's all we're doing here you see i'm closing the door getting him familiar with that it makes kind of a loud latch sound and so i just close the door open it he comes out very nice right and he just gets used to seeing that picture so basically we're just going slow through the crate training process right we're just revisiting it so once the dog has a nice positive association with the crate, then I like developing some impulse control at the door. So a lot of dogs, you open the door, they just bust right out. I don't like that. I like the dog to have some impulse control. So you see when he tries to bust out, I just close the door on his head and then he waits for my signal to come out, right? So I open the door, give him okay, and then he can come out, right? I like doing that personally. So every time he comes out of the crate, he is on a routine. We are doing something together. We're going outside, we're going on a little potty walk, we're we're going in the backyard, we're gonna do some play, we're gonna play some food games, right? We're doing something together. And that's the key, is I facilitate all of these things in his life, right? Inside the home, it's very structured. Every time he comes out, we are doing something together. And that's the key, guys. It, it, all, it all comes through me. I'm going to be very important. I'm going to be a very important person in this dog's life very soon. Uh, in the first 48 hours, I am not focused on making control. Like, I'm not trying to do obedience. I'm not trying to teach this dog to heal. I'm not trying to fix this dog's loose leash walking. Like, I'm literally just building a relationship with the dog, getting them in this routine. That's what I'm focused on. I can make control at any time. That's not a problem. It's just not a priority in the first 48 hours. All right, so the next thing is get to know the dog. So how do we do that? Well, in order to get to know the dog, you are going to have to observe. You're going to have to pay attention. Now, what are you observing and what are you paying attention to? Well, let me make a little list for you. All right, so here's a little list of what you are looking for when you are observing your dog in these next 48 hours, right? So as you are interacting with the dog, when you take the dog out and you are watching the dog and you are feeding the dog, you are observing these characteristics here. So the first thing is temperament. Temperament is kind of like um, it's kind of like a overall descriptor, like a general descriptor that encapsulates a set of general behaviors, right? So let me give you an example. If you say your dog has a calm, easygoing temperament, okay, that might include a series, of, a set of behaviors. Like, okay, your dog is maybe pretty relaxed and chill inside the house when you take them on on walks, like not too much phases them like they're pretty to themselves like nice calm easy going type of dog right not too high energy he's like nice and chill 
right? And so you see like the, the temperament descriptor is kind of like the overall descriptor and then you have like, kind of like these little micro behaviors. Um, another example, if you have a, let's say your dog's temperament is super energetic, social, friendly, whatever. Okay, now that, that dog might give you a very different set of behaviors, right? So temperament is kind of like an overall descriptor, um, but that's what you're basically looking for. Overall demeanors, overall big characteristics of the dog that can kind of describe how the dog is. Um, next thing, sociability. So how is the dog when he first met you or when she first met you, right? When you first met the dog, does the dog come up to you? Oh my gosh, I haven't seen you forever. It's your first time meeting, right? Oh my gosh, look at that person, right? And they want to go meet every person. Okay, that's a dog who has very high sociability. Even with strangers and people they don't know, they're very friendly with right off the bat. Or is your dog more on the low sociability? Maybe antisocial. Maybe your dog doesn't want to interact with just like strange people they don't know and like they don't appreciate people coming into their space or trying to touch them in weird ways. Like they would rather just kind of keep to themselves, right? So is your dog more on the antisocial spectrum? Neither of which is good or bad, by the way. Like it's just who the dog is. All of this stuff is genetic. And so sociability levels of the dog. That's what we're looking for here. So you can notice this like in your first interaction, if you have people that you live with when you bring the dog home, like how does your dog respond to those people, right? Easy test. Next thing, environmentals. So when you take your dog into the new environment, like what, what happens when you take your dog into the car for the first time? Are they putting the brakes? Are they all scared to go in? Or are they just get right in? When you take your dog out of the car and you're walking around your neighborhood for the first time, letting them go potty and stuff, are they, Ooh. Oh, I don't know about this, right? Super sketched out. Ooh, like, oh, this guy's holding the leash still, right? Are they like that? Or are they super confident, forward on the leash, like checking everything out, like this is my neighborhood type dog? Or are they somewhere in the middle, right? Environmentals, how do they deal with that? When you bring them in the house for the first time, do they come in the front door like, oh, I'm not sure about this place. Ooh, hardwood floors, like, oh, I'm not sure about that, right? Or are they crawling on the hardwood floors, trying to smell everything, trying to check everything out, super confident, bust through the door, right? Totally different. Or do they come in, oh, yeah, this is kind of cool, like smell around, sniff around, like, right? All different types. How do they deal with the environmental, just environmental stress? Put them in new situations, new environments. How do they deal with that? That tells you a lot about the dog. Also too, when I'm talking about all this, keep in mind that for a lot of dogs, like you take a rescue dog, you are evaluating them under a state of stress, right? And so it's not, it's not completely accurate on who the dog will become later on, but when you're evaluating a dog under stress, that tells you a great deal about who the dog is fundamentally. Like when you put the dog under stress, like that shows you a lot. Right, that shows you the, the base, the, like the core of the dog, right? How they handle that. You take the dog from a foreign place, you put them in a strange new place with a strange new person, you see how they deal with that, that tells you a whole lot about who the dog is, right? So just keep that all in mind. So next thing, drives. Drive is basically like the dog's desire to have a certain thing, right? And I'm not like a, there's, there's like all different types of drives that trainers will explain and put labels on, but some basic ones that you should know are like food drive. How committed is your dog or how strong is your dog's desire to have the food, right? If you give them their, their kibble, are they like <laughs> out of your hand? Or are they like, hmm, I'll, I'll go do something else, right? Or maybe you switch the value of the treat a little bit, you pull out a little hot dog, and your dog is like, mm, I'll take that. Or they're like, Arr! right? Totally different. How is the drive, the food drive for the dog? How is the dog's prey drive, right? So prey drive, maybe you see little critters, so you see some drive in the dog, right? Maybe you take a little ball and you move it around a little bit, you make, it, make that movement. Does the dog immediately just kind of activate onto it? Or they're kind of like, uh, you know, whatever. Or the dog's play drive, right? 
how how eager they are they to engage with the handler and play a game with the handler, right? So all of these different types of drives we're looking to evaluate. Genetic predisposition. Who is this dog just genetically? Like how is he wired, right? So for example, like when we're taking the dog out on a walk or something, or where I'm just looking at the behavior of the dog, I'm looking at, okay, are these behaviors that he has learned or is he predisposed genetically to these behaviors, right? And so I'm kind of looking at these things as I'm going through it, and you'll see it all with Arrow. Um, learn behaviors. Are there behaviors that he does right now that he's learned, maybe unproductive behaviors, maybe he's reactive towards other dogs, or he is you know, reactive towards wildlife, or he barks at cars, or whatever it is, right? Are there learned behaviors, unproductive like problem behaviors that we'll probably have to fix throughout the training, right? And then I also like doing a little obedience test, right? If I tell, if I give the dog a command, does he do it? Like how much obedience does this dog have? Like has he been trained before? I like going through a little obedience test with the dog. Um, you know, just tell them to sit, see what they do. Tell them to down, see what they do. Tell them to come, see what they do, right? Just basic tests like that and you can kind of see how much training the dog has had, if any. So yeah, that's get to know the dog. So now that we have covered this, let's go ahead and get to know Arrow. All right, this is our first baseline walk with Arrow. We basically just went on a walk around the neighborhood, walked to a park, and we just got to observe. Just pay attention, watch the dog, see how he interacts with the environment, just see how he is, right? Keep in mind, this is at a, in a brand new environment that he's never been to with a person he has never met, right? And so we get to see who the dog is under this stress, right? And right off the bat, I notice he's a big big time leash puller, right? Super big. I've got to keep two hands on the leash. My hands hurt very bad at the end of this video. It's painful to walk him. Um, but yeah, super strong. I got to keep my footing very sure. Uh, and yeah, I'm just observing him here, right? So you can see just how forward he is, how interested he is in the environment. Uh, this tells me, okay, he's probably found a lot of reinforcement in the environment, right? He's probably been allowed to find a lot of reinforcement in the environment just because he can kind of do whatever he wants to do at any given point in time. Here he sees a dog like 50, 75 yards away. He's just super keyed in on it, right? So this tells me something just about his reactivity. And so I'm like, okay, let's see how he is with the dog that's closer, right? I just want to see it firsthand. You see, he's just locked in super stiff. Like he would love to go over to that dog. Uh, I'm just holding him back very firmly, right? And so we're just seeing, he redirects, he goes over to some other behavior. He's super focused on the environment, scanning everything. Here we get to see him behind this fence with his dog. And check this out. So other dog blows up at him. He kind of goes at the other dog as well, right? Like here, he kind of just lunges at the other dog. But watch this. He immediately, the behavior is displaced and he immediately goes into smelling, right? So he goes from reacting at this reactive dog to immediately the behavior is displaced and he is now all of a sudden smelling the ground, right? You see all of this excitement, arousal. You see him just keyed in on the other dog. Like he's not really barking or lunging per se. He's just He's just showing that arousal, that excitement, right? And that leash create is creating some frustration. So that tells me, okay, there's definitely some arousal here for sure. Definitely some excitement, definitely some frustration with the leash, right? And also a little bit of insecurity in his reactivity. Just a little bit of insecurity in there as well, right? He just isn't quite sure how to deal with that other dog barking at him. Um, there in that clip before he was staring at a squirrel in the tree and here he just, he just sees a squirrel and he mm, immediately goes for it, right? So this tells me this dog has close to no impulse control, right? Just, yeah, especially outside, right? And it's just, he just sees something and doesn't. See something and doesn't. See something and doesn't. So throughout the training, what we want to do for sure is build that impulse control muscle, right? That's our goal. Because right now, he's had a lot of success just being impulsive and doing whatever he wants to do because he is so strong and because he is so big, he's pretty much been allowed to do whatever he wanted to do. Like anything he wanted to do, he could just immediately do it and immediately find success in that behavior, right? So we're going to have to undo that in the training. And when we go out and work around distractions outside in the real world, especially, right? So yeah, these are all things that I'm just noticing on this first walk. You see just how 
interested in the environment he is, how forward he is on the leash. Here I'm being very, very, very careful not to slip on this wet wood here on this bridge, which is why I'm walking funny. Um, but yeah, it's hard to even, like you can't even really see on video how how big of a puller he is, but, but yeah. So here is just a little reactivity test. I have Rachel walking our our dog orbit right and you could just see just how he is you see he's not super committed in the reactivity he just isn't quite sure how to deal with being around another dog he just isn't sure how to deal with it right other dogs make him a little excited the leash makes him a little frustrated uh, the other dog makes him a little bit secure right all of these things are into play so this is a play test that we did with arrow we just brought him outside to the backyard and we're gonna clip him on a long line here just to give him more room. And the reason why we have the dog on a long line is to make sure we have control. Just in case he does something stupid, this dog could totally go through the fence for a squirrel, for sure, right? So that's why we have the leash on. So we're gonna clip him on the long line and we're gonna see how, if, if at all, if he's willing to play in a new environment with a new human and a new toy that he's never seen before. This will tell us a lot about the dog. So check this out here. Look at this prey drive, right? I make the ball come alive on the floor like this and it activates that switch in his brain. But look, you can see he checks out very quickly because he's just so interested with the environment, right? And so the environment is very distracting for him just because he's probably been allowed to find a lot of reinforcement in the environment, like sniffing around, chasing wildlife, like that sort of thing. And so that's something I'll have to work on. I'll have to really desensitize him to the environment and really build up the value in me and playing with me and in interacting with me and so on, right? And limiting his, the reinforcement he receives from the environment just throughout the training process, right? So I can shape the picture that I want. Um, but yeah, this is a, not bad for a first, for a first like play session test. Like this was the, this was the second day he was with us. And like, you can see, like he's willing to, willing to engage, like definitely interested for sure. Uh, you can see there, he's showing some nice commitment and this is all amazing to see, right? Because I'll be able to leverage the play tremendously throughout the training. We're really going to utilize it heavily and you guys will see all of the all of the play we do with him and how I build the play and how I teach the games and so on. I'll show all that on YouTube. And so like you can see here, right? Very interested, very interested. He's a little unsure of his grip, right? He wants to target the handle and he's a little, little hesitant to bite down hard, uh, which, is, which is not surprising, right? Uh, you can see here, right? He kind of gets distracted mid rep. I go over, I run away from him, right? I'm trying to play by myself here, uh, but I'd let him smell around, right? The important thing is guys, like I'm not forcing anything. I'm not forcing him to play with me. I'm not forcing him to take the toy. I'm not forcing anything on him at all, right? I'm just letting it, letting everything happen at his pace. The play will come, right? I'm not worried about it. I'm not trying to force anything here. I'm just testing. So you see here, I'm trying to get him to re-engage. I'm trying to throw the toy. He's like, ah, oh, let's check out the environment. I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure about that? And he's like, uh, yeah, let's check out the environment, right? And so that's okay. I'm not gonna win the battle with the environment right now. And so I kind of let this happen. Um, but we'll be developing it later on. This is all very, very beautiful to see. He's got some nice drive. Like I'll be able to work with that for sure throughout the training. So this is fantastic to see just on just day two of having him, which is great. So here we're doing a basic obedience test. I am just testing his understanding of the verbal cue. I stand neutral with my hands on my side and I give the command down give the command sit and I see what he does. Does he hit the position or does he fail? You see a lot of dogs, they don't actually know the verbal command. You might think they do, but when you stand neutral and you don't give them any help or any luring with your hands or any nonverbal cues, you see their understanding completely falls apart, right? And so this was fantastic that he actually knew the sit, the verbal sit and the verbal down. This is great. Now all we have to do with him is start teaching him the concept of must, right? Because right now he only does it when he feels like doing it, when there's something 
in it for him, right? Should I do this right now or is there something else better to do? So we're gonna have to teach him that when we say sit, you must sit. When you say down, you must down, no matter what, regardless of what's happening. Another thing to note is during the first one or two weeks that I have this dog, all of his food is gonna come directly from me, straight from my hand. He's not gonna eat from a bowl and he shows nice food drive. Arrow here is, he likes working for his food. He is willing to work for his food and that's fantastic. That means I'll be able to use food as a reinforcer throughout the training. So is Arrow aggressive? That's the big question that we're looking to answer. I mentioned in the beginning of the video that that's the reason he needed to be rehomed is he does have a bite history. So in his previous living situation, there was an incident involving two young boys who lived at home with the dog. Uh, the boys were left unsupervised with the dog and he bit one of the boys in the forehead area. And due to circumstances outside of the owner's control, she was essentially forced to rehome the dog. So that's the scenario, that's the situation, that's what happened. Now, as I'm getting to know Arrow, I am looking to see if there's any signs of that human aggression in there. If he could potentially be dangerous towards people, towards people he doesn't know, small children, I'm looking at this, right? I'm also taking into account what the owners told me when they handed the dog off. They said that before this situation, he was fantastic around the other boys, fantastic. And like most young boys are, they were very rough with each other and with the dog, but he was fantastic around them, right? They loved being around him, he loved being around them, everything was good. It was just this situation, they left the dog unsupervised with the kids, which they took full accountability for, and he bit one of the kids in the, in the face area. And so, what, what was the cause of that, right? What was the cause of that? What happened there? Was it completely unwarranted, just happens out of nowhere? Was, it, was there a resource involved? What, did maybe one of the kids take it a little bit too far, right? What was the reason? We don't know for sure because nobody was there. But the previous owners let me know that they believe that one of the kids likely took it a little bit too far. Maybe they were playing a little bit too rough. Maybe they hurt him in some way, maybe unintentionally. And Arrow essentially corrected the kids in that unfortunate way, right? And so that's, that's what we're working with, right? But so far in my experience with it, in my time with him, in what we've been doing and taking the owner's story into account, I'm not seeing any signs of human aggression in this dog, right? He doesn't, he's just not offering any of the behaviors that would lead me to believe this dog could potentially be human aggressive. I'm just not seeing it, right? And maybe we'll, we'll see it later on in the training. I'm going to put him in all different types of scenarios and situations, but I'm just not seeing it. So as of now, I think the previous owners probably got it right. Maybe the kids Maybe one of them went a little bit too far. Maybe they hurt him unintentionally in some way and he corrected one of the kids basically, which is very unfortunate, but it's a reality of working with these, these big dogs, right? These dogs can do a lot of damage very fast if you're not, if you're not careful, right? And so that's, that's the scenario that we're working with here, but so far, like in these first 48 hours, just getting to know Arrow, I'm not seeing any signs of human aggression here with the dog. So that's where we currently stand, and we'll keep you updated on that going forward. All right, so now it's time to start building the relationship with the dog. So how do we do that? Well, I like creating a nice working relationship with the dog, which basically means we cooperate and do stuff together and the dog works together with me to obtain rewards and so on. And we learn to work together in that cooperative fashion. I like creating that relationship with the dog. And so basically how you do that in the beginning is you just control resources, really. And what this basically looks like, think about it from the dog's perspective, right? Okay, first 48 hours, they're with you. You are at the center of this dog's world. Literally everything good that comes to the dog comes directly from you. It's controlled by you, everything, right? And so like in the beginning, like you control the food, you control the water, you control access, right? When they get out of the crate, when they go outside, when you do stuff, when you don't do stuff, you control all of that stuff. You control the play, you control uh, just like fun stuff in general, you control games, right? If you're playing like food games or actual 
playing games with your dog, whatever it is, like all things fun, all things good, and whatever else there is, all things good come from you directly. And so even if you have a dog who's like a little apprehensive, like a little unsure of you, a little, little standoffish, right? You do this for a couple of days, like the dog is gonna like you just by a natural, just by natural consequence. Not because you had to do anything specifically, but just because you control all of these resources that are important to the dog and that the dog naturally values and they start to value you, right? Because everything good comes through you. And before you know it, a couple of days later, even if your dog was apprehensive at first and didn't really like you that much in the beginning, a couple of days later, you walk up to the dog's crate, they're gonna start wagging their tail. Happy to see you, right? So it's not something really you force, it's just something that happens as a natural consequence of this, right? So that's just like, that's just like bare bones, super basic, like very, very first like relationship stuff, right? And later on, as we go through the training, we're really gonna improve the, the relationship. We're, we're gonna use play in the training in the relation to improve the relationship. We're gonna use obedience and rules and we're gonna the God's dog structure and guidance outside in the real world and all of that stuff. And then the relationship is really gonna flourish. But like in the beginning, like, this is about it. So the next thing we need to do is prevent these bad habits from forming. How do we do that? We do it through management. And in the beginning, you're using your crate, you're using a leash or a long line, right? Later on, we'll be using a place board, but you are using management, right? These first 48 hours management is really, really important. Management is important in general, but just in the beginning, especially management is key because you don't want to take this dog from this just chaotic state, whatever, and then you throw them into your house in this new chaotic environment and you just expect them to know how to deal with that. Like that's not going to work out very well. And you're probably going to not, not going to like how they learn to deal with that on their own. Right? So what we want to do in the beginning is we just want to manage them. We want to prevent them from making all of those mistakes and learning all of the wrong lessons off the hop, right? The mistake people make is they just bring their rescue dog home, unclip the leash, all right, all right? Maybe the person grew up with dogs before, right? And they just expected dogs to just kind of know what to do. And then you're in for a reality check when you unclip that leash and your dog starts learning all of these horrible, unproductive behaviors. And then a couple months in, you're like over your head and just problems that you need to solve, right? Your dog learned to eat the couch and chew your shoes and pee on the corner and jump on the counters and bark out the window and like all of these problems. And then you go outside in your backyard and your dog is chasing squirrels along the fence line and they're digging holes in the backyard, whatever it is, right? So you can just prevent all those things off the hop with good management. With good management, none of those things become a problem. And then as you go through the training, as you start making control on the dog, as you start improving your relationship, then you can start giving the dog slowly more freedom as they earn it, as they sh prove to you that they can handle it. Then you can give them more freedom without running the risk of like them making all of these mistakes that you then have to solve, right? It's so much easier that way. I mean, it saves so much time and it's just, it's so much easier, right? So just do good management off the hop. So in the house, we manage them, create outside or in the house, leash your long line on at all times, right? So even if you have a fenced in backyard, I am super, super OCD about this. The dog is always on a leash. They're always on a long line, always, always. Because I never want the dog to learn the, first off, I don't want them doing stupid stuff just around, right? But next off, I don't want them to learn that ignoring me could potentially lead to good things, right? So if I tell them to do something, right? If I say, let's go, we're going inside, right? Come on, I can make them do it, right? They're not gonna learn the first day in the backyard that when I say, come on, let's go, I'm just speaking words that don't matter, right? And they never learn that ignoring me leads to good things. So that's key, management. So now I'm gonna give you just a couple of tips to hopefully set you up for success going forward. So the first thing is have a plan. 
right? Have a plan, have an idea of what goal you're trying to achieve, have a plan in place to achieve that goal, know what you're gonna do on a day-to-day -day basis to make progress towards that goal, right? Just have a plan in place because if you don't have a plan, you're just going around willy-nilly, just doing whatever, the chances you end up someplace you're happy with six months from now, a year from now, is very low. So set out with some intent, right? Put a stake in the ground, say, I wanna go there, have a plan in place to achieve that. All right, the next thing is give grace. Give grace to yourself, give grace to the dog, give grace to the previous owner, give grace to the shelter they came from, just give grace, right? Because in this process, like for a lot of people, like you can, you're gonna make mistakes in this process, you're gonna feel frustrated in this process, you're gonna run into problems through this process, and I just want you to know that later on, like as you'll get through this phase, as long as you have a good mindset and you have a good attitude and you are able to learn and seek help and apply and learn information like this, you will be just fine. Everything will be fine. And six months from now, a year from now, two years from now, all of these problems that you had, all of these mistakes that you were beating yourself up about, like it's all gonna seem so small and so funny, like in hindsight, right? Like looking back on it. But in the moment, like just remember, just give grace to all of this, all of this stuff, right? We're all just living beings figuring this stuff out. So give grace. All right, so that's the tips I have. That's the first 48 hours with a rescue dog. I hope this helps. If you wanna track and follow along with Arrow's progress. We're gonna be documenting it all on YouTube. So stay tuned for all that. We'll be posting Mondays and Thursdays, I believe. So twice a week is what we're shooting for. So if you wanna follow along, hit the subscribe and I will see you in the next video. Hope this helps.